Faith, family, freedom, hope, and opportunity. You're listening to Freedom Rings. I'm your host, Senator Marsha Blackburn. Hi, I'm Marsha Blackburn, and so delighted that you are joining us for another Freedom Brings podcast. And you have to sometimes say, okay, how could somebody go from being a liberal Democrat and a New Yorker to going to Hollywood and being a screenwriter and then ending up in Nashville, Tennessee and being one of our country's top conservative columnist? And that's the question we're going to get to ask today of Roger Simon, who is the editor-at-large for Epic Times, a newly minted Nashvillian, and we're delighted to have him as our guest. So welcome, Roger. Great, great to be here, Marsha. And I have to tell you that I don't have any real answers to that great mystery <laughs> that you... I even wrote a book about it, and the book was published twice. It was published first as Blacklisting Myself, which uh, the publisher at Encounter Books thought was probably too subtle. So they changed the title, not the book, to Turning Right at Hollywood and Vine, <laughs> The Perils of Coming Out Conservative in Tinseltown, which I did and lost my friends' money and jobs. So, but, that was, <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, life's great, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, that was fine. Well, I made a lot of interesting new friends. I mean, you know, it happened this way. Uh, I was gradually turning to the right uh, in the 90s. And then when 2001 hit, it was like, snap, I'd go, I was gone. And a lot of people were sort of gone at that particular point in time. And I thought that was natural. We were attacked. All this, this, these things happened that none of us ever believed were going to happen, sort of like now, <laughs> in a different way. And... Uh, so I started, I had a book coming out, and I could tell uh, the publisher, Simon & Schuster, I'll name names here, uh, didn't like the book as much as my previous books <laughs> because the protagonist, the detective hero, was turning to the right a little bit himself. So I, I thought, well, I, I'll try to promote the, this thing myself. And now author websites, if you've seen them, are kind of boring places. <laughs> and they say, oh, look at my nice review on Publishers Weekly, and no one's going to come back to see that twice. But that was just the time of the blog revolution was happening. In fact, uh, the leader of the whole thing was a guy down here in Knoxville, uh, Glenn Reynolds, uh, the Instapundit. And I, was, I said, well, I could do that. And it was all kind of, you know, to promote a book. <laughs> right. And so I started a blog. And I started being honest about my political change and the reasons for it. It didn't promote the book at all. <laughs> it failed completely. Oh. But the blog became a sensation because a lot of people were doing the same thing at the same time. So I started to become friends with a lot of people I'd never known before, like Hugh Hewitt and all these kind of conservative pundits who were saying, oh, look, Roger Simon, this well-known liberal has changed. <laughs> so they, we all became email friends and actually social friends a little bit, the ones that live in California. And uh, I was elected to turn this all into money because they figured, since I worked in Hollywood, I knew how to do that. Uh, that was a lie. But <laughs> uh, that's how uh, then Pajamas Media Right. came into existence. I was the co-founder of that. And as soon as that came into his, uh, existence, the Hollywood phones went dead. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I'm, I, I can, uh, to brag about myself, and I, I'll do it because I'm on the radio here, is that uh, I am the only person breathing who can say he has... <clears throat> Uh, an Academy Award nomination for adapting a, Mo a Nobel Prize winner in literature. I'm the only person who's done that. But, and you would think that would be a ticket to a lot of... Even it was for a while <laughs> until I came out as a conservative. And it's, it's amazing, it's remarkable how dead that is, how, how, 
how extreme it is. There's now a, there's an industry in film for uh, Christian filmmakers. Being Jewish, I'm not really part of that. Um, well, I admire it. I have nothing against it. Mm -hmm. I think it's terrific. But uh, there is no real conservative movement in film. And I'd like to talk to you. You, Marsha, have helped spearhead a lot of the songwriting business here in Nashville. Right. And uh, I remember just after meeting you a few years ago, I went to a fundraiser, John Rich's, for, for, yes. your, for, your, uh, for, your, for, for your candidacy. And I, it was the best fundraiser I have ever been to because it yeah. was really fun, as opposed to most. Uh, but, you know, I, even here, you feel that the creative people are scared. Mm -hmm. I mean, the ones who are on the right, the ones who are on the left are not scared at all. Yeah, and you know, Roger, that has always just amazed me because our creative and innovative community, being able to create and dream up an idea and then commercialize that idea and get it to the market, whether it is a song or a screenplay or a novel, or maybe it's a next generation auto battery. But that is a constitutionally protected activity. Article one, section eight, clause eight, allows our innovators to benefit from their creation. And I, I find it so interesting that Hollywood and the, the artistic community has tilted so far left that if they were in a socialist or Marxist or communistic regime, they would have no ability to create. They would be robbed of that ability, or if they still had it, it would be the state, not them, to benefit. Interesting you say that, because I have more than most, and because of I was on the left when I was younger, uh, I can distantly remember it. At least I've written about it, so I can look back. The, uh, you know, I, I was in the Soviet Union a couple of times and on, in, on writers' cultural exchanges, so I got to see what it was like for them. And I had very eerie experiences because I, I met some of their, you know, most prominent writers and filmmakers mm -hmm. and in, in Moscow. And, you know, I would be in this, they have, then they had two buildings, scriptwriter one and scriptwriter two. If you could believe this is how mechanized it was. And they all wanted to live in it. And they came to me and said, oh, Roger, it has the best health care. <laughs> that way. I mean, healthcare is so strong in how these things get manipulated. But as we know now and during COVID, but they, these same people who were having millions of books published by the state because they were saying the right thing would then come up to me very privately and say, and this is before I had any kind of political connections at all. Even if I did, it wouldn't have mattered. Uh, <clears throat> can you help me get out of here? I mean, to have people whisper, whisper that in your ear, it's, a <laughs> blood, it's kind of blood curdling. It, it was like, it, it made me very upset and nervous because, uh, first of all, every time, I, I was in China in 79, that's how, mm -hmm. every time I've been in one of these countries, and I've been in Cuba, uh, after a week or two, you're there, you're desperate to get out. You're desperate to leave and you get very paranoid. It's maybe not even paranoid. Uh, you're desperate to leave it. You feel maybe they won't let you out because you mm -hmm. feel like you're in this giant jail. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've never been in, thankfully, a small jail. I mean, except the visit, but I've, I've never. But you experience even something as large as China or Russia as a jail. And mm -hmm. I, I was reminded of it because of what's going on in Cuba right now. Mm -hmm. Because when I was in Cuba, which was in '79, also. I remember uh, we were trapped getting out and how panicked I was feeling. And finally, it was Raul Castro that let our group out. 
Well, and sometimes when those avenues of freedom get closed off is when people do begin to panic. And I have to tell you, I think in our country right now, there's a lot of buyer's remorse uh, from people that voted for Joe Biden. There are so many people that are missing President Trump and his policies. And there are people that are saying, you know, what I really want to do is fight to defend our freedom. I'm worried about the next generation, whether it's the spending they're looking at or the clamping down on free speech or the way big tech is pushing back against free speech or whether it's the lack of support for Cuba or for the people of China, and I should say the people of Cuba or the people of China, or the lack of support for the Hong Kong freedom fighters or trying to go in and do another deal with the Iranians or the uptick <laughs> of uh, terrorism mm -hmm. that we're seeing in the Middle East. This is unnerving to people, and I think it makes them realize how important freedom is. Boy, do I hope you're right. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I'd cross every fingers for that. I, I, I'm sometimes astounded that everybody doesn't feel that way. I, I, it's so obvious that it's, it's ama the, the, the bid for power on the part of the left in our culture today is so beyond. I, you know, <clears throat> it's interesting because I was on the left, as I've made clear here, when I was young, and it was a different thing. It wasn't what's going on now. I mean, I'm not saying I was on the right side that I wasn't, but it wasn't as, as this is very scary right now. And I think people, I think what's going on with those women in Williamson County, that I've been writing about for the Epic Times, um, with the fight against CRT in the schools, right. is extremely key. Because it's waking up people who wouldn't nor who wouldn't, might have some political interest, but wouldn't normally be up against the wall the way they are now, with their mm -hmm. children being indoctrinated. It's a not, what's going on in this country is is, is not to be sneezed at slightly. I mean, we are probably at a historical crunch time that's similar to the French Revolution. I, I agree with you. I do think we're at a crunch time. And the Marxism that is seeping through our communities, uh, people are going to have to get in this fight with, with all of us because we're having to basically pivot and fight on all fronts at one time. And they're continuing to push, uh, whether it is H.R. 1 and federalizing elections or three and a half trillion dollars of new spending on top of, you know, 1.9 trillion dollars worth of spending on top of another 1.2 trillion dollars <laughs> worth of spending. The numbers just don't stop. Um, on our podcast, we like to talk a lot about what freedom means to a person. And I find it so interesting that it was an event that woke you uh, to freedom and freedom's cause and to the value of conservatism. Talk a little bit about how you walk through that process. Well, it's, it's kind of interesting because uh, as being a relatively well-known writer, um, <clears throat> when immediately 2001 occurred, uh, I remember being in the bedroom of my home in Los Angeles then, watching the planes fly into the into the buildings that I knew very well because I grew up in New York. And my my most immediate feelings were, oh, well, there's something wrong with radical Islam. And we better confront it or it's going to take over the world. So it began with me with foreign policy. And obviously, I have problems with the mullahs and all of that. but. <laughs> I, then very shortly thereafter, I knew socially the editor of the New York Times. And we were having dinner in New York, and he and his wife, and I was there with my wife, and, and they had started to read what I was writing on my blog, right? And it obviously irritated them slightly, but they were curious, too, how someone like me, who was identified one way, would, would, yeah. and they started to, and they asked me, well, do you feel that way about the economy, too, and taxes and so forth? And I realized 
that I hadn't really thought about it. So yeah. <laughs> you were asking about how that happened. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, yeah, had I read Milton Friedman, yes, I'm an educated person, but <laughs> I hadn't really given it that much thought. Yeah. So uh, what I ironically happened is that the editor of the New York Times stimulated me against his will to go home, start reading Hayek and, um, and Milton Friedman again and and Mises and all these people. And I would think that Thomas Sowell. And Thomas Sowell, of course. You know, uh, his transition from being someone who self-identified as a Marxist to being a conservative and a, and a really a an outstanding conservative economist. Oh, the best. Yes. He, he, what's interesting is there aren't too many people that you know of who've gone the other way. Very true. Just like I tell people all the time, name me somebody who's tried to break into China <laughs> to pursue the China dream or Russia for the Russian dream. The only person I know that really fought to get into Russia was Bernie Sanders for his, you, <laughs> you know, know. I was uh, in Russia at the exact same time. Yeah, for his honeymoon. Yeah. In 1988. And uh, we didn't see the same country. I mean, uh, this, the anecdote I told you slightly before when people came up to me and said, help me get out of here. I mean, these are famous people in the culture. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. If Bernie lives in a world that, no longer, that, yeah. that, you know, he comes from something that doesn't exist. I yeah. mean, it's the kind of... Uh, I know it very well because I'm also Jewish and I know how that happened. Yeah. I mean, way back in the 1920s, a lot of Jewish people in Russia thought that to become communist atheists would mean they would escape oppression. And the reverse happened. Yeah. But people like Bernie still don't get that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? So it's a Let me ask you this, Roger. You are one of the great thinkers of our time. So what really worries you the most? As you're sitting down to write your Epic Times column um, every day or so, what really what really burdened you the most when we talk about preserving freedom? I think what's really worrying me about preserving freedom is something I have written about, and that is that a number of people in our government, and I think you would probably know better than I who's who in this, have made peace with the fact that China is going to defeat us, if not on the battlefield, economically and, and in, in terms of power, and are acting accordingly. That they are essentially, they, they see their own personal welfare and wealth, because let's face it, in the Chinese form of communism, some people do very well. There are more billionaires, according to Forbes, in Beijing right now than New York. Mm -hmm. So. I think a lot of these people, and those people scare me a lot because they're powerful. They're people who serve alongside you. And in some cases, at the moment, higher. So well, let's hope it doesn't last. But yeah. if you're asking me what scares me, that really scares me because I don't know. Other than, I mean, listen, I can put it down in, the, in, in digital form on the Epic Times, but. Well, I think How you're so right. You know, people need to realize we have to believe in America. We have to believe in this experiment that we have going for freedom. We have to hope that people are going to wake up and that we are all going to see our great nation's better days in front of us. And that spirit of America first, not America alone, but America first uh, I, I, I'm, will truly, I'm with you all the way, Marsha. Uh, <laughs> well, that will truly prevail. Yeah. Well, it looks like that we've hit the time on the clock. Roger Simon, fantastic guest. And people can find you on social media. They can follow you at Epic Times. And thank now you. Now they can follow me on Getter. <laughs> on Getter. Yeah, there was, you go. Because I was yes. a friend of, J, old friend of Jason Miller who started it. And uh, he said, get on here. So I said, OK, it's not going to be Twitter. So here I am. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> and that's a great place for us, uh, for us to be. Thank you so much for Thanks joining you. us.
Thank you for listening to this episode of Freedom Rings. You can follow me on Twitter at Vote Marsha, Facebook at Marsha Blackburn for Senate, and on Instagram at Team Marsha. And you can always find us online at MarshaBlackburn.com. The Freedom Rings podcast is edited and produced by Jared Cummings. Executive producers are Conservative Partnership Center and Marsha Blackburn. Together, we make Freedom Ring.